Thank you very much for your kind introduction and good morning. One of the ma most magnificent parts of David was his unlimited mind. So when, when we look at the mind and the maps, it was the prepared mind that saw what an amazing process could be revealed by the static appreciation of a map. And in fact, that observation did lead to our understanding about causality. One of the earliest citations for growth in David's work was in 1985, where he uses the words fetal growth, intrauterine growth, and postnatal growth in the same concept to, to lay out this process that we all know him for so very well. When I first read about David's work, I read the abstracts about fetal growth, and I fully expected to open the manuscript and find fetal data. And so one of the early reactions I had to this enterprise was aggravation, because birth weight was the only nature of the evidence I could find in most of these papers. And since I am a growth person, I can only say that I found it aggravating that this static, cross-sectional summary should have the arrogance to stand for fetal growth. And it's really interesting, because as a growth person, one of the challenges, the scientific challenges going forward with data, David's work, is how we characterize the concept of growth. This slide was made with a Wordle, and a Wordle is something, if you don't know, where you put in text, and it sends back to you, according to size, the most frequently used words. So this Wordle was made on the basis of 100 publications of developmental origins and growth, and it shows you that, in fact, the most commonly used variable to stand for growth is birth weight. Now that's really interesting because that is both an outcome of the growth process, a summary statement, and a predictor. And it's used actually both ways in the research. The second point I wanted to make with reference to this visual is the enormous variability in the kind of things that are measured under the rubric of developmental origins. Now, while that's interesting, it actually poses a terribly difficult problem, because we're not all talking about the same things. And weight is a very different variable and summary statement than any kind of bone measurements, for example. And it has much more to do with energy in and energy out, one could argue, than a fundamental growth process, which I think is one of the things we're trying to get at. Now, that matters because in the naive sense, and in the simplest sense, I think people kind of believe that there's something about single measurements that do matter. And as you can see, quite a different group of growth predictors, quote unquote, different measurements, predict outcomes in different systems. And therefore, and this is one of the things my students have great difficulties with, you can't make the assumption that because you have some growth parameter, it's going to be meaningful in whatever the outcome variable that you chose to measure is actually trying to tell you. So there's a confounding between what we understand as growth and therefore what we're looking for growth to predict. This is particularly difficult in a theoretical sense. And I thought this was a very good summary statement when Karl Popper wrote about robusticity in theories. One of the things that he said was by making interpretations and prophecies sufficiently vague, and we can add data sufficiently vague, it's really very difficult to prove or disprove many theoretical concepts. Thus, if we continue forward and think about the way that we think about growth, a next example that I find useful is the way we have embraced clinical definitions <coughs> of growth. And those are often based on proportionality, with the paradigm assuming that we know something about the timing of fetal growth, because we know something about when the body parts themselves actually grow. So this marvelous photograph showing asymmetric and symmetric uh, intrauterine growth restriction, because they're triplets, not so surprising, 
gives evidence to part of the difficulties, again, that we have. And in this case, we're using clinical proxies of growth, not anthropometric ones alone. And the different results that have, res that have been observed in different samples make that categorization as a predictive variable equally difficult to handle. In looking at that kind of proportionality and the way we've used it, the intrauterine growth restriction has been categorical in two dimensions. One is if you're long and thin, and one is if you have a relatively greater head than body. And those are defined often by head to abdominal circumference ratios. In the real world, one of the questions one can raise is, really, do these two categories summarize everything? And I think the last slide says, no, probably not. It's not so simple. Now, this matters because there's a call to action from the epidemiological evidence that David and his colleagues and many people in the room have published, that birth weight and body proportions are an inferential data set. But what are they inferring is the question that growth people have to address. And that's what David and I brought together to collaborate about. What about growth? So what is growth is actually the problem. If growth is the predictor, what is it, what is it doing? Is it only size? Some of the original data suggested it's size. Well, what is size? We all have some sense of size. Many of you have measured your children or your grandchildren against a wall with whatever technology you had at hand. And I have colleagues who, if you can't exactly see what's going on here, you recognize this as a doorway in a kitchen and a close-up of the measurements on the wall. I have colleagues who have moved their doorways with them when they changed houses, and I don't know how you would take the wall. But this is a serious matter for many people. Now, that said, that size alone doesn't really mean anything. It's size. It's one point in time. So we give it meaning by putting it on a growth reference chart which have been collected to illustrate statistical distributions of size for age. And that is a meaning, because it tells you relative to peers how tall or how short is an individual. Now, that's very useful. The problem with this approach is then we somehow begin to believe that the chart is actually telling us how children grow and how they should grow. When, I repeat, this is a statistical distribution with sm smooth curves through means and percentiles. That's all it is. Nonetheless, we have in growth a very strong historical tradition that that graphic represents trajectories. And a beautiful example was articulated by Jim Tanner in the mid-80s, when very similar time to when David began his work. So we believe that this is a target-seeking function. That belief then leads us to another group of concepts in growth that are actually not as clear as one might think, yet we use them all the time. There is a conflation between compensatory and catch-up growth. And so with the trajectory model here, you have two kinds of phenomenon going on. This graphic shows the little girl who suddenly falls, quote, unquote, off the growth curve, starts to slow her growth, and then is faced with the hope of climbing back up during a catch-up growth phase. In point of fact, this utilization of the same word, compensatory and or catch-up, is everywhere in the literature. And we assume that after a period of undernutrition and reduced growth, children may undergo accelerated or so-called catch-up or compensatory growth. The problem is that among growth scholars, they actually are a completely different phenomenon. So if it's not completely obvious to you what this graphic is trying to show you, you will be in good company because many people argue greatly about this. But in fact, the term compensatory growth is used to describe the type of growth that occurs after the loss of an actual mass of tissue. Whereas catch-up growth compensates for the loss of potential tissue. It's a very different kind of phenomenon. The problem, again, being, unless we're using the same vocabulary with the same physiological phenomenon, we're actually not using the same kind of biology to predict or as an outcome. So growing is very different than the connect the dots kind of phenomenon that we have been doing when we plot children on growth charts. And what you're looking at here, the black dotted lines are the new WHO median 50th percentile. 
and the colored dots represent three children who are growing through time. Now, if you look at it, the blue kid looks like they're just jumbo, way off the 90th percentile and trekking on forward. Actually, there was nothing particularly unusual about this, this uh, infant. This is, you're looking at the zero to, to 12 months of life graph here. Then if you look at the green and the red lines, that's a different ph phenomenon. The red line <coughs> person is the same weight at birth, but really kind of just doesn't take off like the jumbo jet on top. She's kind of going along slowly and then kind of tries to make her way back up a curve. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the red dots. Her parents work at the American Center for Disease Control and believe me, if there was a problem with that child, they would have been on it. It's just the way she grows. The green child, likewise, is a really interesting case. The green child, by the age of five months, really looks like they're declining and this is a typical breastfed child. So the point I'd like to make, in summary, about growth is we don't know what we're talking about, unfortunately, very frequently. And yet the word is the word used for the causal relationships. And until we understand, and thank you, David, together, what that really means, we cannot progress in interventions in as fine a way as we really must. So the size versus growth phenomenon tells us that there's a problem with the way we think about trajectories. Because every time you measure a child, you're measuring at one point in time, and it represents a summary of all kinds of influences up until that particular time. If you walk away and come back, same can be said, but you actually have no idea what happened in between. So measuring growth requires the accumulation of many of those snapshots. In fact, you absolutely don't know what happened between those two times, three times, five times, and the connection of the dots is the fundamental physiological scientific problem we are faced today. Individuals follow different paths. This is confounded by our protocol at infrequent measurements, and this graphic shows you the same child if you measure them only monthly, semi-monthly, weekly, and or daily. And as Alan said, that is my work. And when I did that first, everyone said to me, do you believe your data? And I said, data are data. And they said, but there's no known mechanism, so you must be wrong. I said the same thing, data are data. And until you ask the question, you can't know about the mechanism. So the part of the conversation I had with David is what is this about and how does it help us try and understand? mechanistically, how these environmental influences actually work. What you're looking at are the daily data of the little girl in the picture, and it's a stepwise function, so her growth over the first 405 days of life was not background noise on a daily basis, but it was a specific event. And the timing of those events are the purpose of the bar at the bottom with the vertical lines. So it's not every Sunday night she grew. It's not periodic, it's something else, it's episodic. And therefore, my interest is what's going on at those particular times? That's the question at hand. And this kind of process is what you all know because all of a sudden the socks and the pants don't fit. So in fact, you really do know that this is going on. To give you perspective, it's the same process in childhood. What you might notice here is the steps are longer, so growth is less frequent. That has an implication for our methodology in terms of uh, intervention studies, where if we're going to do an intervention and somebody doesn't grow for six weeks and you just happen to have a six-week timeline, timeline for your study, you're going to come away with a potential negative uh, intervention outcome, which may mean nothing at all. And finally, the same is true during adolescence. At each of these time periods, there is a biological package that's going on. Children eat more, they sleep more, they're likely to get sick, and they gain weight, and then they stretch. So it's truly plump and stretch. And that was said in the 18th century, and by visual appreciation, it's quite the case. So what is height measure? Our animal research has shown that it is at the cellular le level at the growth plate, and it's exactly the same kind of phenomenon. It's episodic. What controls this? We have absolutely no idea. The hypothesis is that it's genetics, and these are two genetically identical twins, 
uh, little girls who grew at the same time and approximately the same amount on all but two occasions where they are off by a few days. As we now go forward and think about how environment affects growth, the important thing for us all to be very clear about, as my colleagues have just said, is that it's a process. It's not static, it's an ongoing process, and there are many, many points at which the outcome is reassessed for the next building block. The one thing that is very evident in our work is that the fetus and the infant are not bystanders waiting to be impacted. They're very much a driver, and babies grow even when they're not eating. No doubt there comes a point at which they don't. But there is a growth process that is part and parcel of this package. And to give you just a view on what that means for fetal growth, since that's our topic, fetus grows the same. These happen to be femur length measurements because they're something that is more accurate than other things that one could measure, and different children grow differently, but it's episodic. So what we think we know in the case of fetal growth with size, it's very important that we recognize that there's a process that the size alone cannot show. These different outcomes were followed by these very different patterns. The summary, then, is that the growth process is, in fact, a system. And I think that for all of us to be much clearer about what we're trying to do is very important as we move the science forward. The things that we don't know include exactly when during fetal growth do these things happen in most, meta most textbook pictures of the critical period concept were designed from teratogen studies, and they stopped somewhere about 13 weeks. There isn't a very clear, even in our didactic approach to growth, appreciation for the importance of organ growth trajectories. That's a marvelous place for a number of students to work very hard. And overall, a, a conceptualization about the dynamical system properties is probably very <coughs> important area to work in. So David was remarkable in the very different sciences that he has brought together. I find it absolutely stunning each day when I read about an economist or a public policy person or very far of fields that have never spoken before are now coming together to speak about this kind of work with a common goal of improving health. That's a remarkable statement, and thank you very much, David. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>